In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee. Be happy then through Christ our Lord. O Mother most sorrowful, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The conference this morning is on, uh, well, the title was the, the Virtue of Suffering, but we need to explain a few things because technically speaking, the virtue isn't suffering. Suffering is the activity that gives you the virtue, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But I want to talk before that. Can we speak up a bit? Okay. I want to talk a little bit first about virtue. Because when we talk about the virtue of mortification, of which suffering is the act that we undergo in order to attain that virtue, we need to, uh, the virtue is something that's key because, you know, sometimes we read about the lives of the saints, how there was great joy with them, even though their level of suffering was uh, extreme. And I think to man under after original sin that seems a little irrational that people would be happy even though they're suffering at the fall one of the th reasons that we ended up with this horror of suffering this fear that of suffering is one is because suffering itself causes kind of a pain and a dissonance and we don't want to do that but why don't we want to do that well part of it has to do with the fact that some speculation is is that our lady, or that uh, when Eve looked at the fruit and told was told that God is keeping something from you by not you know that he, he the reason he doesn't want you eating this fruit is because then you'll actually know good from evil you'll be like the gods and so she looked at it and she the, some speculate that she didn't want to be she didn't want to lose out or be separated from a possible good that she could have. And that fear of suffering, that loss of something good, is what, and Adam did the same thing, which is what, why we ended up with this horror of suffering. Some of it, I think, is just due to our general moral weakness after the fall. But this, hor this horror of suffering is, the, is a defect, and it can be perfected over, in the sense that we can overcome it. So back to virtue. Virtue is a good habit, it's a habit, which means that you have to develop it, you have to keep doing it over and over and over again in order to become very proficient in it. In the beginning stages, when we don't have a virtue, to perform the act of virtue is contrary to our disposition, and so it's painful and difficult. So to suffer well in the beginning is very difficult. You can do it through an act of the will, just saying, okay, I'm going to choose to do this. But in order to get to the point where you have the virtue of mortification, where you suffer well, you have to be doing it over and over and over again. In heaven, everybody is sanctified and they all have sanctified perfection, which is excellence in grace. They have a lot of sanctifying grace and the adornment of soul of all of the virtues. It's one of the reasons for purgatory. If you don't master if you don't master that willingness to suffer in this life, your, your soul is not going to be pleasing to God unless it has that virtue. And so that's one of the reasons for purgatory in addition to making up for our, the temporal punishment due to our sins. But that virtue in which you do it well, it's easy because virtue makes doing the action easy. This is one of the reasons why we want to attain virtues in all the areas of our life so that the moral life is easy. But it means even the area of suffering becomes easy. Not in the sense that you don't have the pain, but that it's easy to offer it up, it's easy to undergo it, it's easy to accept it. And that's what virtue does. A habit makes something easy. If you don't find it easy, it's a sign you don't have the virtue. The other aspect of virtue is there's two things that Aristotle says about it. He says, virtue makes the person good morally. Why is that? Well, it's because the virtue in, in our faculties inclines our faculties to morally good things. And so the person who has virtue is going to be inclined interiorly to do the morally good thing. And that means he's morally good. 
The second thing is, so it makes you good. And then he says it makes the action good. What does that mean? It perfects the action. Let's back up just a little bit. Most people have this idea. It started with Kant. Kant had this idea that the person who uh, the suffering is difficult, but he offers it up, is actually more meritorious than, the, meritorious than the person who does it easily. That is absolutely false. The fact of the matter is, is that when you do an action with virtue, it perfects the action so that there is a kind of an adornment of the action with it being done better than if I hadn't done it without it. Let me give you an example. Take not so much a virtue, but a set of habits that someone develops. Take a figure skater. If I put figure skates on, or put skates on, got out on the ice, it wouldn't be very pretty. <laughs> All right. I mean, I might be able to kind of turn around like this, you know, doing the things very slowly, etc., because I don't have the habits that go along with the person who's perfected the art. Whereas the person who's perfected the art effortlessly, they can do things, they can move around. It's the exact same thing with virtue. Virtue makes it possible to engage in things that of themselves are very difficult, but with less effort. It makes it easier. And it also perfects the act so that like the person who has perfected figure skating, when they do it, there's a beauty that's involved in the action that they're performing because of the fact that it's done so effortlessly, but it's also done with uh, a certain kind of modesty or gesturing that makes it look like, you know, there's a certain decorum to what they're doing. This is one of the reasons why virtue is called the beauty of the soul, in addition to sanctifying grace. It's called the beauty of the soul. And the reason it's called the beauty is because of the fact that beauty has a few attributes. One is that there's kind of a symmetry. So what this means is, is that uh, in virtue, there's a symmetry between the perfection in my faculties and the external execution of that action. It's done well, not haphazardly, not, you know, not done poorly, but it's done well. And so there's this symmetry between the virtue in my faculties and it's the exterior action which is done well. There's a certain completeness to the action when you have virtue because of the fact that there's not something missing from it. That lack of being able to do it easily, that means there's something missing. The other thing is that it is there's a certain kind of a clarity or a splendor about it. Somebody who does figure skating and has the art, there's a certain manifestation of its excellence in the process of that. That's what splendor is, a manifestation of an excellence. And so the person who has virtue, when they do it well, it manifests it, that uh, perfection is manifested, that excellence is manifested well through their action. So there's a certain kind of a beauty to the person who has it. The other part of it is, is that not only is it beautiful to behold that the person who does a virtuous action, but in point in fact, the person who has virtue gets a delight out of doing the action. Why? Because St. Thomas says that when we perform an action in congruity with our disposition, we get a certain delight. Now, when we have a virtue, our body adjusts to the operations of that virtue so that when we do it, we actually get an emotional delight in doing what is virtuous, even if the thing is, is in itself difficult. This is why St. Louis Marie de Montfort said, in relationship to Our Lady, that when she would do actions or perform certain things, because she, her entire life was a life, she never did anything that wasn't virtuous. So that her entire life was a constant action of developing virtue. So that by the time she got to the end, because she never committed any sin, she didn't have any defects, her soul was so perfected that when you just, just to gaze upon her soul and see those virtues was a beautiful thing to behold. <clears throat> but it also meant that there was a certain kind of beauty to the things that she did when she did them in, in the order of virtue. When she stood beneath the cross and suffered to a degree that no other human being ever suffered, 
that was done so perfectly and so effortlessly that there was a that it was the most as one demon described it it was the most glorious action of any human being in the entire history of humanity so what is this and so and it was delightful that is even in suffering when you master the virtue of mortification where you can engage in things that are painful and difficult and you embrace them and you do them well there's a delight that comes from being able to do that if you don't have that when you suffer if there's not an interior joy if there's not that interior delight that comes with it then you know you have not mastered that virtue this is why you're gonna have to spend time in purgatory you're either gonna have to do it now or you're gonna have to do it later this is also why the saints say that it is a sign of favor from God to send you suffering because he is trying to fashion the virtue in your soul and that he's willing to send that he doesn't do that with everybody why well because some people he doesn't send them suffering because of the fact that they end up uh, not doing it well and that they're just going to sin through it and so he doesn't send it to them so he sends it to a person in order to develop that virtue to perfect it Another thing that virtue does, and especially the virtue of mortification, is it purifies us. Why does it purify us? Well, what does it mean to make a thing pure? Well, let's back up. What does it mean that a thing isn't pure? It means that there is something present in the thing that doesn't belong there that's bad. So a person who, is, uh, who suffers from... Uh, kind of an impurity of soul, here we're not talking about the sixth commandment because there's three different kinds of purity. There's purity in relationship to the sixth commandment, which means externally you don't perform any actions contrary to chastity. The next level is purity of heart or mind. That's in relationship to the ninth commandment, which means you never have, you don't engage in any thoughts or you re always reject all the thoughts that have anything to do with re in relationship to uh, things that are contrary to chastity in thought and in affection. But the next level of purity is, the third level of purity, is when a person never allows anything into their mind other than God. God is purity itself. And so the person who constantly focuses on God has that third level of purity. This is what Our Lady had perfect mastery of her entire life. Nothing in her life wasn't referential to her son that is to God. Nothing. Or to God himself. Okay. So how does it purify us? Well, suffering purifies us in this way. The defects in our lower faculties, that is, when we make bad associations, when we think badly of people, or when we have emotions that are contrary to what reason said is supposed to be, that means there's a defect there. There's some type of impurity there that shouldn't be there. Now here again, we're not talking about the sixth or ninth commandments necessarily. We're talking about like even in anger, there's an impurity in the soul because the purity would be that it's totally perfected and that it's totally focused on God. But it's not there. So what is, how does suffering overcome that? Well, the lower faculties, when they have those impurities it, or those bad inclinations, have an inclination towards something that's disordered. When reason knows the right thing to do, reason knows that there are certain times that you must embrace the cross. It's something that God has sent to you. You must accept it because why do you accept it? It's not that you want to, it's not that you want to embrace suffering as such. Because suffering as such is actually a physical evil. What you're doing is you're embracing this suffering because it purifies you. It, it's the effect that you are embracing. That is, it's going to make you better. Or through it, you're going to merit something that, some, that, that you wouldn't if you didn't embrace this cross. Now, merit is based upon our state of grace. You can't merit anything in the eyes of God without being in the state of grace. So if you, if you have a lot of sanctifying grace and you have a lot of virtue, it means that your actions are more meritorious in the eyes of God. This is why St. Louis Marie de Montfort said that a single sigh from Our Lady is more meritorious than all the martyrdoms, all the good works, all the sufferings of all creatures combined. 
because of the perfection with which she would do that. Okay. So the suffering, so how does this purify it? It purifies us because reason, knowing the right thing, knowing the good, stays the course and continues to command the lower faculties, even though they're suffering and they don't want it because they have this aversion towards it, says, no, I'm going to embrace this. And as it embraces it, the lower faculties learn that the suffering is not to be avoided, that there's a good thing from it. So the first thing is on the side of the will, if you're going to master this virtue on the side of the will, you have to choose to embrace your cross, regardless of the suffering that is involved. Then, as you make that choice over and over again, your will starts to become strengthened, so you get less weak will. The lower faculties then are, are willing to embrace it, and over the course of time, as those faculties um, become trained, they start to fall into line and then there's a certain joy that you take even in your lower faculties in relationship to the suffering. You actually develop the virtue of fortitude because you can embrace, embrace something that's hard and difficult. You know, part of courage and fortitude, there's a real misunderstanding about that out there. People think the person who's brave is, oh yes, I was really scared but I did it anyway. That's not the person who's brave. The person was scared. That's not bravery. What bravery is, is being able to engage or in, uh, something that could cause you harm, but you do it reason recognize this is the good and it stays the course and the lower faculties recognize that this is a good thing to pursue despite the fact that I could die from it and they just pursue it anyway because they recognize this is the truly good. So what is the virtue of mortification? Where does it reside and what faculty? It actually resides in the irascible appetite. Now the irascible appetite is the one that deals with anger. It's the one that engages in things that are arduous and difficult. But when we have the virtue of mortification, the lower faculty, when it sees something that's painful and difficult, it doesn't flee from it. Instead, it seeks after the good that can be accomplished by engaging in it. It's not irrational in the sense that it just engages in things that are painful. That's just sadistic. Instead, what it does is it recognizes that through the pain I can, rec I can gain something good. So the person who has that spirit of mortification has to, they have a natural inclination towards pursuit of the thing that's arduous and difficult. But it, even though it's in the irascible appetite, there's a concomitant virtue that also has to be obtained. And that is the willingness to suffer. Mortification is the virtue in which I engage in difficult actions to kill, literally means mors fautere, to make dead the life that the lower faculties have on their own independent of reason, which is the result of original and actual sin. So that's what mortification is. It's that engaging in, that willingness to kill the lower inclinations contrary to and engage in things that are painful and difficult. But it has to have a concomitant willingness to suffer. And how does that come about? The willingness to suffer is in two different faculties. It's in the will, but it's also in the concupiscible appetite. The concupiscible appetite is that which desires bodily goods. And so we have to get to the point where we have this willingness to suffer in the sense that we're willing to put aside things that are on a bodily level are good or pleasurable so that we can actually seek what is necessary. Without those two going hand in hand, we're never going to obtain that virtue. So this is one of the reasons why the saints embraced it. In fact, if God didn't send them suffering, they would very often think to themselves that there's something wrong with me that God isn't willing to allow me to suffer. Now, this spirit of mortification or this virtue of mortification comes in two ways. The first and primary way is to accept the crosses that Christ gives to you. One of the things I've learned as a priest is that very often the specific cross that Christ sends to the person is tailored to two things. 
The first is the spiritual need of the individual. This is important. This is why your spouse has the defects that specifically drive you out of your tree. <laughs> this is why God lets you marry the particular individual because through their defects, once you learn to suffer them well, you're going to be able to look past the person's defect and think to themselves, what is the best for this person spiritually? And if you have that, that's the sign that you've mastered that willingness to suffer, that you're willing to look past your own suffering and the defect that they have that's causing you that difficult to what's spiritually best for them and for you and everybody involved. Okay. But they tailor it specific. God tailors it because it's through that process that we can get our faculties rightly ordered and we go through that purification process. Part of purification is that one of the effects of the purification process is kind of that in freedom and that lifting of the burden of it. So what most people don't realize is that our defects are a weight. They're a burden that we carry around with us. And that when we unload them, there's a certain lightness to our interior life, as I mentioned last night. But it means that the saints knew that the suffering was their path to freedom in a certain sense. It was their path to this lightness, this interior freedom that they would actually end up having so that they didn't shirk from them and they didn't get angry, they didn't perpetuate their bad uh, disorders by getting angry with the people who had it. So the first thing that you must do is embrace the crosses that are sent to you. Regardless of how long they've been there, regardless of how ridiculous the person is who's causing you the pain, or whatever the case is. The second thing is, is then, so you have to embrace what Christ sends you. That's the first and primary way. That's where the perfection is really going to lie. And this is very important because in the three stages of the interior life, the, passive, the, the active purgation is the suffering that we do on our own. But, the, but once there comes a certain point that our sin and disorder is so deeply rooted in our souls, it's so deep that we are incapable of rooting it out on our own. We're capable of causing the damage. We're not capable of repairing it. So Christ has to step in and send sufferings to us interiorly, if nothing else, to purify the soul so that through that process, the disorders of the soul will be fully removed. That means that you, you will never enter into the passive purgation until you have reached a certain level of mastery of the virtue of mortification. In other words, Christ doesn't take over until you have already mastered this on your own to the degree that you can. So, people wonder, why. Well, I just don't understand why I'm not advancing in my spiritual life. It's easy. You just ask them, well, first of all, are you doing meditation, which is another matter. But are you doing, uh, are you embracing every cross that comes? No. Well, then you're never going to get to this passive purgation. The act of purgation is when we engage in things that are painful and difficult on our own. And so the, spirit, the virtue of mortification is when we take on sufferings, we do specific things which we know will, uh, and we tailor them to our, what we know as our defects. So for example, if I have a problem with not having my concupiscible appetite under control in relationship to food, that every time I'm around food I'm eating too much, then what I need to do is I need to start fasting and doing uh, abstinence so that I get that thing under control. Most people will tell me, I'll just say, well, you, you know, maybe you should take on some fasting. Well, I found fasting really difficult. Yeah, well, get in line. <laughs> but that's not the issue. The issue is, is you need to start fasting. You need to start doing certain kinds of penance, abstinence, etc., staying away from those things that you like so that you attain the virtue in relationship to them and you purify your soul. But you have to be willing to engage those things that are painful and difficult. This is true across the board in every single aspect of our spiritual life. There is no virtue that in the beginning stages isn't going to be painful to develop to some degree. And so you have to be willing to engage in that pain in order to attain it. But it also is true in relationship to um, the sanctification of our souls. If you embrace your cross and unite it to Christ's, 
And as a result, and if you're in the state of grace, you can actually merit an increase in the sanctifying grace in your soul. This is one of the reasons why the saints became very holy, because of the fact that they had a lot of sanctifying grace, and they had a lot of sanctifying grace because of the fact that they had performed these actions over and over and over again. Their suffering went on for long periods of time. You have to be willing to go the distance in all of this, which means you have to be willing to suffer for a long period of time. Sometimes people will tell me, Father, I can't do that. No, you can't really on your own. You can engage in certain things on your own and kind of master it to some degree. But in the end, the only way you're ever going to attain perfection in this area is by just cooperating with Christ that when he sends you the suffering, he's going to give you the concomitant level of grace necessary in order to be able to do so. But you have to be willing to do so. Okay. Now, one of the things that is important for people to recognize is people will very often say, you know, I don't understand how, how it is with God and the saints that, you know, there's all these supernatural things occurring in their life and they become very, you know, there's all this, this person is always acting according to charity and faith and this, that, and the other thing. St. Thomas says that when you're in the state of grace, and this is what the church teaches, when you're in the state of grace, God infuses in your soul all the infused virtues. Not only do you have faith, hope, and charity, but you also have the infused virtues of fortitude, temperance, justice, and prudence. So people say, well, wait a minute. If I've got these virtues, how come I'm not very prudent? The answer is very simple. It's because, St. Thomas says, those virtues cannot be fully active when there's some impediment in the soul. There's some impediment in the faculty in which they are infused. So, for example, if you're in the habit of acting imprudently and stupidly, the, the infused virtue of prudence isn't going to be able to operate very well because of the fact that it's impeded by the defect of imprudence. If there, how many times, you can just ask yourself this, have you known the better course or the right thing to do but you chose the wrong thing? That means that you are imprudent every single time you do that. You are engendering the vice of imprudence. Every single time you sin, you are engendering the vice of imprudence. That means, and so which means that your lower faculties just aren't going to give you the right images in order for you to act prudently either. So when it comes time to perform the prudential thing to attain what, something supernatural, you're not going to be able to judge the right thing to do very well at all. In fact, you're going to be just to be imprudent. This is one of the reasons why we need a director, a spiritual director. Now, I tell people, you know, sometimes people come to me, would you be my spiritual director? I said, okay, <clears throat> I'll be your spiritual director if you do one of, you have to do two things. Go home and stop venally sinning. And I want you doing 35, 30 to 40 minutes a day of meditation. You get to that, and I'll be your spiritual director, which means I never usually see 99% of them again. Because <laughs> people have this idea that, well, you know, <clears throat> the end of the spiritual life is getting to the point where you don't sin. No, that's the beginning. In fact, the active purgation, when you reach the la last stages of active purgation, you've gotten to the point where you're, venially, you're not venially sinning pretty much anymore. It's then that Christ takes over. You can stop sinning through ordinary grace. It's not extraordinary. People think that never to sin is extraordinary. No, it's not. I mean, I know a woman who is possessed by Beelzebub who went seven straight months. Now, we're talking the top dog. She's possessed by the top dog. She went seven straight months without committing venial sin. Seven months. And then she floundered a little bit, but then she got back on her feet again. The point being is, is even under that kind of duress, with the grace of God, you can do it. So what does this mean? It means and that, okay, so you've got these defects. You're not going to act prudently. You're not going to be just. You're not going to be temperate, etc. It means that if you're going to have the supernatural virtues of, of prudence, which has God as its object and helps me to know the right way to attain him, do do the right things to reach him, which is the right end. If I'm ever going to attain that and be proficient in it, because sometimes you can ask a saint and they'll just, they immediately see this is what you need to do. And they're like, how do you do that? 
Well, it's because these things are operative in them because of the fact that they've removed all their defects. You will never attain that without embracing suffering. Because it's through the suffering that those things are purified and removed from us. Our defects are removed. Those impediments are removed from our faculties so that we can, in fact, act well. So, then, this means there are certain things that we have to be willing to do. Embrace any cross that comes. You have to start in, uh, doing fasting, mortification, prayer. You have to be willing to pray. Pray is arduous. It's difficult. In the beginning stages, it's painful, quite frankly. And, you, and, and, and because you don't have the virtues that help you to pray well. You know, people say, oh, I find I'm just distracted all over the place. Yeah, that's just a sign you don't have any virtue. So start working at doing it. And you're never going to get to that point where your distractions are completely gone, or for the most part gone, I should say, because in this life, because of the defects of our lower faculties, even once we reach perfection, the saints say that God will allow the lower faculties to, to kind of get their disorders now and then, not because that we haven't attained perfection, but he'll get, allow those inclinations from time to time so that we have to maintain our virtue by keeping them in check. It doesn't mean we don't have the virtue, it just means we have to do it. So that those lower faculties become perfected to a certain degree, but not absolutely perfect like they are in heaven. Okay. But we have to be willing to engage in those things that are difficult. So we have to be willing to pray. That just means that if your mind is all over the map, it means that you're engaging in things that keeps your mind, your lower faculties distracted, especially your imagination. So you're going to have to start working on that. And that comes through, uh, that comes through uh, meditation specifically. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas says, you cannot fully overcome any defect fully in any of your faculties without meditation. It's not possible. And I think this is true. It's, not, it's simply impossible for people to obtain that stage where they get to the point where they're not venially sinning. They can't do it without a consistent life of meditation. And it means that you have to engage in, the, in the, the suffering of actually doing the meditation. You have to get into the suffering, be willing to do the suffering of a regimented life. People just want to say, I just want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Yeah. What you're really telling me is you want to indulge your lower faculties whenever they want to do something. That's really what you're telling me. Rather than doing what you know reason knows is the right thing to do at a particular time. So... You have to be willing to have a regimented life, which is also painful and difficult and a form of mortification. You have to be willing to suffer the defects of your spouse, your children, and those things well. You also have to be willing to do, fulfill your duties according to your state in life with exactitude, not sloppily, not whenever you get around to it, but with exactitude. When you see it and you've got the time and you know you should do it at that time, you do it. You just do it. It also means that you need to find out if you have a disordered emotion. The disordered emotions just tell you what vice you have. That's, all, that's, that's why if you pay close attention, if you have any self-reflection, which is becoming less and less today, people are so focused on everything outside feeding their appetites that very few people have a real deep ability to self-reflect. And usually when they self-reflect, they end up with the problem that St. Thomas says. He says... We have a natural inclination when we think of ourselves to see ourselves as good. And so as a result of that, we get a kind of pleasure out of thinking about ourselves. And he says, if we basically don't mortify that, then what happens is, is that it affects our judgment about ourselves. And we tend to think we're more spiritually advanced than we are. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me claiming that they're way into the illuminative stage and they haven't even perfected the active purgation stage. But they think they're at, I'm, I'm, I'm at this stage, I'm at this stage. Actually, what happens is you advance in the spiritual life, it gets darker. Because God starts stripping from you your ability to see those things in yourself, and that's why you need a director when you get to a certain stage. But there's that stripping from you of your ability to see yourself so that you rely on Him and His grace to illuminate you about your true state rather than your own judgment of yourself, which is very prone to exaggerating and making you think you feel better. So you have to work on all the virtues. This also means the virtue of humility. You really want to master mortification, you master that virtue. Now that virtue is just like mortification. Once you get proficient at it, there's a delight in engaging in the things that pertain to that virtue, even though you're suffering. 
in the relationship to virt uh, the humility, it's the same way. It means that in humility, there is a, once you've ma- get, gained a certain degree of perfection in that virtue, there's actual delight in being humiliated. Now, if you want to know how much virtue of humility you have, just think of yourself whenever you're humiliated. Is it painful? Does it cause you pain? And if it does, it tells you you don't have much of it. But when you become proficient at it, there's actually a, d- a delight in that. And there's an ease with which you accept that humiliation. But you won't attain that unless you're willing to suffer, unless you're willing to embrace your cross. You're never going to master that. In fact, the two go hand in glove. You're never going to master humility without that willingness to embrace your cross and willingness to suffer. And on the other hand, you're never going to um, attain a willingness to suffer without some humility. People who are proud think themselves so good that they don't need to suffer. They don't need purification. They don't need to go through this. Or it's unjust that they should actually go through this. <clears throat> well, there might be a certain level of injustice on the side of the other individual who's causing this. But if you honestly believe that the suffering that God has sent you, that somehow or another you don't deserve it, I can't help you. It doesn't matter how unjust people are to you, or unjust. It doesn't matter. If God sends it to you, it's a sign that either you deserve it, you need it, or that he wants something from you in it. Which means he'll send you your sufferings, which gets to our second point. Not only does he send our sufferings to tailor us to our own perfections, so that we overcome our own imperfections, but he'll often tailor suffering because he wants a certain level of virtue in your life in a particular area that you would not have if he did not send it. And this is what people need to keep in mind. The suffering is there to attain a level of virtue so that when you're in heaven and everybody can actually see your soul, they actually see it. They will see the sanctifying grace in your soul. They will see the virtue in your soul. And so they will know exactly how much virtue you obtained and have. They will know exactly the degree of their sanctifying grace so that when they see that, they will admire the work of God in your soul. That's why God wants it there. He's perfecting your soul. He's adorning your soul with all the virtues. So if you're, there's some type of great suffering that you have in your life, you know, if you don't already know, because sometimes we know, oh, I've got this suffering because, you know, the sins of my youth or I just didn't do X, Y, or Z. But sometimes we don't really know why he's sending that particular suffering. So what we need to do is ask him, what virtue is it that you want me to obtain through this suffering? And then we'll end the conference with this. Our Lady of Sorrows. It is said that Our Lady is the Queen of Martyrs. People say, well, why, how could she be the queen of Mars? Because she never died. They say, the uh, authors say, that when St. Simeon told her, prophesied about what her son was going to suffer, that from that point on, she became Our Lady of Sars, that she bore the suffering of knowing what was going to happen to her son the entire duration of her life until the Passion. And that she knew that St. Simeon's, even though it's shorthand, you know, that he will be a sign of contradiction. In the scriptures, it's shorthand. The father of the church says that he gave her details of what he was going to go through and the passion and what it was going to look like, etc. And yet she knew how beautiful, how good her son was and what she was going to do. From that point on, she carried that suffering her entire life which means that interiorly she died to herself at that moment. She also died to herself even when she accepted to be the mother of our Lord because she had to sacrifice herself in relationship to this because it meant the course of her life was then predetermined. So she dies to herself there, but the suffering begins when she presents Christ in the temple. From that point on, she went through her seven sorrows, she suffers that entire duration. That's why she's Our Lady of Sorrows. Obviously, Our Lady didn't need purification. The reason she became Our Lady of Sorrows is to merit specific things, 
to merit the title of Queen of Martyrs, to merit a level of fortitude and mortification that other people didn't. She, mer she stood beneath the cross, and as a result of that, because she died with Christ interiorly, because she was so focused on Him, she was completely lacked self-reference, she was so focused on Him that her dying interior was complete when he died. So that as a result of that interior death, she merited the, uh, she merited the reward of being mediatrix of all grace. She merited the queen, being named queen of heaven and earth. She merited literally everything a mere creature can merit. Think about it. She merited dominion over the, the totality of God's creation. Totality. That meant the heaven and earth. That meant all of the physically created universe. It meant she, because she's the mediatrix of grace now when God crowned her, that was giving her the mediatrix of all grace when he did that. It meant that she could dispense spiritual goods. She could dispense grace. She actually has the dominion over your own interior life. So this is what God gave to her as a result of her willing to suffer at the foot of the cross. Every time we turn away suffering, we're basically rejecting that spiritual good that God wants to give to us, which makes us so much different from Our Lady who embraced everything that God sent. So if you want to reach perfection, if you want to take joy in suffering, if you want to do this, you have to work on this virtue consistently in order to perfect it. Okay, the first question is, when interceding for someone who has mental illness mixed with possible oppression, besides staying in the state of grace and obedience to one's state in life, what is the most efficacious thing to do? Um, yes. So when interceding for someone who has mental illness mixed with possible oppression, Besides staying in the state of grace and being obedient to state in life, what is the most efficacious thing to do? The most efficacious thing to do is to, uh, at least that I've found, is to pray to Our Lady of Sorrows, specifically under that title, and ask her to reveal to you what is the source of the person's problems or difficulties, um, either to reveal it to you or to the other person, so that once you know precisely what the problem is, then you can tailor the prayer specifically for that. If you discover it's diabolic, then there's certain things you can do to get rid of them. If it's something that's there's some area of their spiritual life that needs shorn up, you can start praying specifically for them for that virtue. You can develop that more of that virtue on your own, offering that up uh, for that person so that they are able to overcome the particular difficulties. Sometimes with mental illness, if it's something that's organic or natural, that is, it's something in the, in the brain or something like that, you may just be stuck with it, and the person has to learn to adapt and develop the virtues in relationship to what they're suffering. Can you speak on generational wounds? How does this occur, and how are they healed? Can your parents' vices issues leave you with spirits to battle? The common opinion of exorcists is yes, it can. There's a couple of exorcists who say, no, I don't believe in any of that, but... Uh, my experience has been very consistent that basically what spiritual wounds are is uh, that are, if they're from a generational spirit, there's uh, basically what happens is, is somebody in the family lineage, usually one of the fathers in the family lineage, commits a serious sin. The demon gets introduced into the family lineage, and then from there he picks at the people um, and that can be passed, and as a result of that, when people kind of give in to the picking, it gets passed from generation to generation. And sometimes these can go on for quite some time. Uh, it doesn't affect everybody in the generational line. Sometimes there's some people that seem to be exempt from it. It doesn't, the, the nature of the demon doesn't always pick according to his nature. So he may, like, it could be a demon of pride, but he'll drive issues of chastity in the family, you know, contrary to chastity. So those can actually happen. The demons can also, once they get their foot in the door, can drive people to commit sins that cause psychological and other wounds to people, to their family members, to the children, and things like that. 
then what happens is, is the demon can get their foot in the door into that person's life through that process. And then the demon can pick at the woundedness and drive the person to do those same things, ironically. So it can be passed generationally in that way. Sometimes he just gets into a person's life and drives them to do other things that just cause damage in other people's lives. The vices of parents are twofold. One, they can open up the door for demons getting in and affecting people, but they can also be just a thing that kids learn. Let me give you an example. If every time somebody gets, an, if one of the parents gets annoyed, they just blow their stack, what you're basically teaching the kid, now the kid doesn't think to himself, oh, when this happens, I blow my stack. He's not thinking that. It's just part of our brain structure is automatically designed that when this happens, I associate this behavior so that when the time comes, all that is brought up and so the person will get the inclination to do those very same things. So the person, I call it implicit learning. The kid can just learn the behavior from the parents. So that can happen, but not always. Sometimes parents have hidden vices, like vices against chastity, and the next thing you know, some nine-year-old kid who's, they're living, externally that things seem to be chased, but the father, say for example, is doing really um, bad things, like watching pornography on the internet or something like that, or engaging in really bizarre activities. The next thing you know, this kid is having that identical ideation from no external cause whatsoever. It's clearly diabolic. And so the, this is one of the reasons why it has to be so. So how do you heal from that? Well, if it's psychological trauma and wounds, then you can listen to my conferences on wounds and healing. I can, there I kind of lay out this is, how, this is what a wound is and this is how you heal from it. If it's a generational spirit, I highly recommend, again, you pray to Our Lady of Sorrows and ask her to reveal to you what is the generational spirit that's in your family. My personal experience in dealing with people is, is that virtually every family has one. And so this is why each family has kind of these eccentricities or quarks very often. In, so if you can find out what, if you pray to Our Lady of Sorrows, what is it that's, uh, that's our family? Because a lot of times what you see isn't the problem. So for example, in one family where chastity was kind of an issue and also um, kind of a lot of quarreling went on in the family, the demon was actually a demon of fear that was driving it. So once the family discovered that, they were able to start working against that and things started to subside. So this is one of the things that you could just kind of keep in mind. Ask Our Lady to pray with Our Lady of Sorrows what it is. Then once you know what it is, then you can do things like binding prayers, asking for protection, etc. Or maybe even have a priest pray over your family to drive the thing out. To have you as a spiritual director, um, what do you have to do? Okay, so 30 to 40 minutes of prayer a day. But then the other thing is stop venally sinning. Stop it. I don't know if every, if, if, if you want to find, uh, watch a funny video, go on YouTube. And there's a video, just, just type in Bob Newhart, stop it. Right? And it's this woman who's doing these compulsive things. And the end, he just tells her to stop it. Right? Just stop it. Right? Well, that's the way it is with sin. You have to just stop it. And that means, though, that you're going you're gonna to have to start doing other things. You have to make the choice, I'm going to just remove these sins from my life, I'm going to stop them. In fact, most people are recidivists. Now, a recidivist is someone who goes, who repents, uh, or goes to confession, but really has no intention of amending their life. And how do you know that? Well, most people go to confession and they'll confess venial sins and each week it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. What that tells you is, is that even though they don't like the sins, they're not really, they don't really have a purpose of amendment. If they really had a purpose of amendment, they'd think to themselves, I gotta get this thing out. I'm gonna take the means. I'm gonna go ask Father, what do I gotta do to get this thing out of my life? But they don't. That's why Teresa of says, look, if you just removed one vice a year or one sin a year out of your life, in a few years, you'd be practically sinless. But most people just don't do that. And that's because most people are spiritually slothful. So you have to remove the, um, the uh, stop venally sinning. Part of the reason I put that as the criteria, because then I know they've reached probably the end of the passive pur or the active purgation. And so it's at that point where the spiritual life starts to become dark and that's when they need the direction. Before then, they normally don't need the direction. And if they have some type of grave sin they're overcoming, then they just need um, advice once in a while, just not consistently. 
is to take pain medicine for physical pain to reject the suffering we are sent. It depends on why you're taking it. If you're taking it because you like the way you feel from those drugs, uh, that's a bit of a problem. But if you're taking it so that it can take the edge off of it so that you can fulfill other duties of your state in life, then there's nothing wrong with that. Um, also, uh, sometimes the pain that people end up uh, receiving on a physical level, especially towards like, say, those later stages of cancer, certain kinds of cancer, can be excruciating. And the person, um, if the person has a certain level of virtue, they may be able to tolerate that uh, in relationship to um, morally and not take the pain medication. But some people get so severe that basically they may have to take it. Sometimes, too, you can take it, even in those particular cases, even if you did have the virtue, if it's the type of thing that taking the med pain medication would take the edge off it so that you would have um, a greater ability to function so that you could pray more or do certain things rather than just sit there in, in a kind of a painful stupor, so to speak. So I'm not saying that they, you should never take it. On the other hand, I'm a little nervous with people who, you know, the minute they get a hangnail, they're running for the medicine cabinet, right? There should be a certain willingness to suffer to some degree, and the only time you take it is when it's starting to impede your ability to um, do some of the higher virtues like prayer and things like that, or fulfill your duty as your state in life. What do you do if no priest wants to be your spiritual director? Maybe you need some self-examination. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, how important is it important to have one? In the initial stages, it's not that important. You just have to come to basic knowledge of the, the spiritual life, which you can gain either through the Internet or from paying attention to the homies. You start putting that stuff into practice. That is, lead a life of an ordinary life of grace, going to the sacraments regularly, praying regularly, working on your vices, etc., doing spiritual reading. Well, once you reach a certain stage, as I mentioned, it's important that you get one. What do you do if you can't find one? Well, finding a good director is getting more and more difficult. Teresa of Avila used to say that if you have a choice between a holy priest as a spiritual director and a knowledgeable one, take the knowledgeable one. And the reason being is, is because the knowledgeable one is going to know how the, the mechanics of the spiritual life work and she says that he's less likely to give you bad advice. She said she had numerous holy spiritual directors who gave her very bad advice and it didn't work out very well. Because just because you're holy doesn't mean that you have the knowledge necessary. Okay, so what you need to do is find a priest who actually understands the spiritual life fairly well and people say, well, how do I know that? Go to confession. He listen to his preaching and go to confession. The advice you get in confession will tell you whether he's gonna be a good director or not. And if there's nobody in the area, then you just have to start praying to Our Lady to provide you with somebody at some point. And she'll make sure that at that time that you'll get it. Is the genesis of suffering privation? Actually, that's the genesis of all evil. All evil is the result of a privation of a good that should be there. It's a privation of a do-good. What does it mean by privation? There's something not there that's supposed to be there. So, take for example, fornication. The reason fornication is wrong is because there's the privation of the bond of marriage. That's why it's, that's why it's evil. Murder, the privation is, is that there's the lack of um, something penal in the person that's being put to death. So, um, in other words, they're innocent. So that's why murder is immoral. So there's something lacking that's supposed to be there. So in suffering, what's happening is, is that there's something that's not there, whether it's the right order of our faculties, and so as a result we were experiencing pain. Um, it couldn't just be the, uh, the lack of physical health, it's caught, and as a result we have physical pain as a result. So there's always something lacking. Meditation. I was taught to meditate by a New Ager. However, I meditate by prayerfully asking Jesus to uh, help me uh, quiet my mind so that I can hear his directions. Am I doing it right? That's one way of doing it. What I recommend that people do is um, you can get, uh, uh, I think it's even on the internet somewhere, there's about an eight page layout by St. Francis de Sales on how to meditate. It's the shortest, best synopsis, one of the best, if you're looking for something short, that's the best synopsis. So you can type in the internet, St. Francis de Sales, um, you know, methods of meditation or whatever. 
If you want a greater understanding of how to meditate, the book The Ways of Mental Prayer by Lahodi, that's spelled L-E-H-O-D-E-Y. Uh, it's put out by Tan. It's the best book on meditation I've found anywhere because it goes into all the do's and don'ts, the structures, the different forms of meditation, how you actually engage in the meditation, its structure, the mechanics, etc. So it's it's a bit of a dry reading, but when you get done with it, you'll know what you're doing. The ways of mental prayer. The ways of mental prayer by Lahodi, L-E-H-O-D-E-Y. Last I saw, Tan now has all their books on Amazon, if you want to go through Amazon. Um, but you can also order it from them directly. To what degree does one take physical mortification? Uh, it depends on what you mean by take uh, physical mortification. Um, the, to engage in things that are f physically unpleasant and difficult has to fall under right reason, which means you engage in them to the degree that's necessary in order to develop the virtue. Um, if there's something that's just going to impede, for example, your, ta your fulfilling of your duties and your state in life, you don't just sit there and take the physical mortification, you try and get rid of the thing. This is an important point, by the way. There are certain crosses in a person's life, there are two kinds. There are permanent crosses that God wants you to carry for the rest of your life, basically. Then there are temporary crosses that Christ wants you to carry for the time that's necessary to develop the virtue. Now, those temporary crosses are of two kinds. One is the ones that Christ sends you and you don't have much control over it, so you just have to endure it for as long as he decides it's going to be there. But there are certain crises that actually come from a diabolic cause and those are the kinds that you don't carry for any more long than you have to. Your job is to get rid of the guy out of your life. Because sometimes people, for example, who are possessed or under diabolical influence, well, this is just the cross of Christ. Me, excuse me. No, you're in spiritual battle here. Your job is to whip this guy. Okay. Will you talk about the virtue of silence and what that virtue looks like in the lives of people in the world, especially mothers who have to interact with people so often. But let me preface it by saying this. Uh, if you, it, through modern brain studies, what they've discovered is, is that the speech center in a woman's brain is three times the size of a man's. <laughs> what they've discovered is, is that women get 10 times the amount of pleasure drugs in their brain from talking than men do. <laughs> okay, now, people say, well, that's not good. Actually, it is good. When it's done moderately, what does that mean? The reason that God put that in a woman's brain is because of the fact that they've discovered through, also through modern brain studies and through psychology, that if you don't talk consistently to children under the age of five, over the course of time, it will cause physical brain damage. That God actually put that in a woman. It's a perfection that they put, she put in her so that she will talk frequently and readily to the children to develop the speech in their uh, uh, centers in their own brains, etc. Okay. But that means, though, however, it's for your children, not your husband, okay, <laughs> or other people. So it means it has to be moderated. And that virtue that moderates is that is the virtue of silence. And the virtue of silence means that you speak no more or no less than is necessary given the circumstances. So with your children, you speak with them regularly, etc. But when you're, when you're not, then you, you generally, the tendency should speak only when necessary. That's the general thing. Now, some saints will say that you have to stand before God and account for every syllable you speak. That's true in the sense that, not that if you talk a little bit too much that it's necessarily sinful, but it's not developing virtue. And so it's an imperfection. And so, concretely, that basically means that, you know, when you get on the phone, you know, you basically, you know, if you need to arrange because it's the soccer game is tomorrow, well, then you call and say, what time is the soccer game? Where is that? Okay, thank you very much. And then you get off the phone. You don't sit there and spend 45 minutes talking about how bad the coach is. Okay. Hopefully there's nobody here coaching <laughs> soccer. If the devil has dominion over the earth, isn't the one sending us all our suffering, isn't he the one sending us all our suffering, like concentration camps, when things are horrific? Then God sends us grace to uh, uh, and overcome them. God gives us grace to overcome. Does God give us grace to overcome evil? Okay. 
first. Uh, it's true that the devil is involved in a lot of the evil that is in the world, but not all. Some evil comes to us as a result of human beings' choices. Now, the demons might be, you know, encourage them to do so, but some of them come from that. Some evils come from the hand of God in this sense. He will retract from, say, a person or a group of people or a nation a particular grace or benefit in order to chastise them or to gain greater virtue in them. This is what's coming down the pike. He's winding up to whop us. And the fact is, is that he's going to do it by retracting the benefits that we have, such as a good economy, plentiful foods, things like that. He's just going to retract it. Because all good, he has to be the cause of it. So that means that he, he can just retract it. So not all suffering um, uh, comes directly from the devil. A lot of it does, but not all of it. Okay. Do you have any advice on how we can raise our children so that they have less fear of suffering? For example, I have heard some people argue that parents should not rely over much on punishments because they can inflame in our children a fear of suffering. Well, I tell, first let's address, there's two parts to that question I want to address. The first is, uh, Dr. Spock does not trump God. Okay, now Dr. Spock came out with this idea, and very other people did, came out with this guy that you should never f use corporal punishment for your children. The problem is, is that especially under the age of five, children don't have the use of reason. So trying to reason with them is ridiculous. When you hear these parents, the kid's two years old, Johnny, don't you see the suffering you're causing, Jane? Why do you do that? The person who needs to be slapped is the parent. <laughs> All right. The kid, the, the Aristotle made a profound observation very early on. He said, children under the age of reason learn by associating pain with bad behavior. Now that means though, however, that that has to be moderated in relationship to the punishment. It should be no worse than, you know, you don't, you know, if the kid just, you know, uh, you know, says something a little bit out of place, you don't take him and whip him to death, right? I mean, that's just not, it's just disproportionate. So it should be proportionate to the crime, and it should, so it should be no more, no less than the nature of the crime and the degree of the crime, okay. The second side of it is, is that, uh, in the scripture it says, spare the rod and hate your child. People who do not um, use corporal punishment in their children in the end don't form their children properly and as a result they don't understand that there's certainly moral right and wrong. One of the things that they're discovering is I find this very fascinating. There's a psychologist that I work with who's done some initial research and she's found that uh, in relationship to people who have disaffective disorder, which is the inability to have emotionally connect with people, etc., and also these kids that are going in and mowing people down with AK-47s and stuff, like in schools and stuff, they have one thing in common. They went to daycares. Now, I'm not saying that the daycares are the cause of it. What I'm suggesting is, is this. First of all, you take a kid, there's 20 other kids there, then there's two people trying to take care of it, which means that there's not that tactility. And, and the reason that God gave women a stronger emotional life is so that they can empathize with the child to bond that and make that spiritual or uh, emotional connection so that we have a sense of right and wrong in relationship to other people. But what happens is, is we take the kid, we put him in a daycare. The thing is traumatized, basically, in the end, because of the fact that it's in this situation that's kind of brutal, because it's getting beat around by the other kids. There's nobody comforting the thing, etc. And so as a result of this, the kid ends up with these disorders, right? What does this mean? It means that the foundation for the moral formation of a child is before the age of reason. You have to associate pain with evil and, um, and reward with the good. But that means you have to have both. You can't just punish the kid all the time whenever he does something wrong and never reward him when he does something right because then he never gets a sense of motivation to do what's right. Okay. So does it inflame a fear of suffering? 
Yes, if it's disordered, it will. But the fear of suffering is there from original sin. Every kid is going to have it de facto from original sin. There's nothing you can do about it as far as them getting it. All you can do, though, is teach them that, you know, sometimes when you do things that are difficult, you get a good payoff. There's a good reward in the end. Let me give you kind of an example. I use this, this example in relationship to God and why God allows demons in our life. You know, sometimes when a father, you know, he's got this four-year-old boy, and he really likes his four-year-old boy, and he wants him to kind of tough him up a little bit because um, he just wants him to be a, you know, a, a, young, a fine young man. So he takes him to a boxing ring, and he puts those great big gloves on. You know, the ones that are so big the kid can hardly even hold them up, right? And he puts him in a, a boxing ring with another kid that might be a little bit bigger, right? And he says, okay, when you go in there, this is what you do. And he gives him a little coaching, and he says, you know, when he goes, keep your hands up, and you fight, you know, when he says, you, you, you hit him, right? Now, the reason he does that is so that the kid can take a little bit of a beating in the process, right? And the reason he allows the kid to take a little bit of a beating in the process is because he wants the child to learn that, look, I can take a bit of a beating, and I'm okay at the end of it. The suffering isn't going to kill me. I don't have to avoid it. And at the same time, if he does it right, he might take the other kid out and then he re realizes the reward that sometimes to get the thing that is good, you have to be willing to suffer and engage in things that are painful and difficult to get there. So even when kids are small, having them do little things that might be difficult, so that, but then rewarding them when they achieve it, they begin to realize, hey, I can do this. I can get a sense of, you know, I can suffer and it's okay, it's not going to kill me. And so, and, and sometimes in the end, they're willing to kind of do those things. So the next thing you know, the kid's like, Dad, can we go back to the boxing ring? You know, so uh, obviously you don't want him in there too long because you don't want all the concussion issues that they get. All right. Would you give recommendations on how to discipline children considering their temperament, uh, such as a choleric child? Uh, well, you know, if I, with every single, uh, this is what I suggest you do. Uh, buy my book on psychology. Because in there I talk about all the temperaments and how each temperament has to be motivated. And so there's some basics in there that you can, uh, you can read. Um, by what principles should someone determine uh, good children's literature? There are essentially two principles. The first is, as long as they don't teach anything contrary to Catholic teaching. So if there's anything in there contrary to Catholic teaching, you have to avoid it. Second, is it the type of literature that will benefit my specific child on an intellectual or uh, uh, on a developmental level? So it's not just, you know, will it help him to read better or will it help him to do it? It's also, is it contrary to that? Sometimes the good literature, too, is the ones that can do both, where they can engender a sense of morally right and wrong, etc., or the pursuit of virtues or... You know, sometimes uh, I think, you know, one of the great things about um, the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy or, or a lot of Tolkien's works is how engaging in the battle and the suffering in the end, the triumph occurs. And so that's why we always have to fight evil when we come across it to the degree that we can. How best would a wife respond to a husband who does not lead spiritually? Well, when you get married... Uh, in the past, they used to give a woman a rolling pin. And I'd say, just beat him over the head with a rolling pin. No. Um, one of the things I would do is, <laughs> I don't want to do this self-promotion, but I don't know of anywhere else to send them. Uh, you know, one of the things you might do is have them listen to my conference on how to raise a man, because in there I talk about how, you know, it's the husband's role to lead and that he has to be willing to suffer in order to be able to do that. And that is his job, it's his responsibility primarily to lead the family, since he's the head of the household, not just on a material or natural level, but even on a spiritual level. The other thing I would do with the wife is you have to start praying and, and suffering and giving, and so that he receives the grace. I'm offering it up so that he receives the grace to start leading spiritually. And the next one is you have to be willing to suffer this a little bit. Start saying binding prayers on any demon that's keeping him from rising to what he's supposed to be in relationship to that. A lot of times you start doing that, his head will clear a little bit and he'll stop being so worldly. Okay. Uh, is acupuncture okay? Uh, well, first let me ask, the, the second question is Pilates okay? 
Uh, my understanding from other exorcists, I haven't delved into the plotting stuff too in depth, but they all pretty much say, no, you have to avoid it across the board. And I'm not sure why, because I haven't gotten any detailed information yet about it, but they all say, no, stay away from it. As for acupuncture, there's two kinds of acupuncture. There's, uh, one of the things is, is that they have discovered through scientific studies that acupuncture does actually have a foundation in, uh, scientifically in being able to ameliorate pain or have certain effects. They've been able to track, actually track the physiological effects, so they know the physical causation. So um, on a purely scientific level, it's okay. So I basically say then if you're gonna have acupuncture, you need to make sure you know your practitioner. The practitioner has to be completely separated from the Eastern practices that go along with that. For example, the, you know, that this affects your chi and it affects, you know, the, the chakras and all that nonsense. You have to avoid that like the play because it's through that that the people can become diabolically influenced through acupuncture. However, if, it, if they're doing it purely from a scientific point of view and it's purely done like a physician, I know a good Catholic physician who does it and he's completely divorced it from all of that. Um, then what happens is uh, that it can actually uh, help people in that respect. Okay. How does someone determine if they should seek professional counseling? If someone should seek counseling, then what should he or she look for in a counselor? Um, there's two parts to it. One is that you determine that your problem isn't a spiritual problem. If it's a spiritual problem, because some of our psychological difficulties are the result of a spiritual problem, then you need to really see a good, solid priest first. And then if that doesn't clear it up, then you can go see a um, professional counselor. If the, in other words, if you determine that the problem is a strictly psychological problem, that's when you want to basically see a counselor. What you want to look for in a counselor is two things. One is that they're Catholic, and by Catholic I mean not in name and not in their own practice, but in the way they counsel people. It should be integrated into the counseling and not just some, yeah, I'm a Catholic counselor, but then you get there and it's all Freudian, right? It shouldn't be that. The second thing is, is I highly recommend you look for someone who has, who has, uh, who implements a Thomistic approach to it. In other words, they follow the principles and understanding of how we function psychologically from the way St. Thomas understood it. Because those are the guys that tend to have the highest degree of success. Okay. How would you advise introducing virtue to children at the initial emergence of reason? Or even things to emphasize in early childhood uh, when impulses and emotions are not mediated by reason? Okay. Uh, the way you have to do that is children before the age of reason cannot develop virtue and the reason they cannot develop virtue St. Thomas says is because virtue is voluntary you have to have free will in order to do it children don't exactly have free will before the age of reason because in order to make the choice as I mentioned last night you have to have use of reason reason has to present the will its object and they don't have that fully yet so what you have to do is, is you have to, again, make these associations. They are trainable. As one uh, woman who's a wife of a psychologist, he said, she said, look, basically before the age of reason, your kid is an ape. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So uh, basically what you have to do is the same way you would train an ape. All right? Not exactly, obviously. But the point is, is that you have to do that association of with... Um, pain with bad things and um, pleasure with good things or reward with good things. But part of the other thing is too is, is that you know children even before the age of reason are not that stupid. In other words, what you can do is you can teach them, you know, if you keep doing this this way, it gets easier. And then if, as you do it and it gets easier, then it's less difficult to, you know, to obey mommy or things like that. In other words, get them into the habit of seeing that if they do something repeatedly they get a better outcome and it becomes easier so that's kind of the initial stage and then as they start getting um, once they kind of get into the habit of that and then you train them to like to be temperate like don't eat the cookie look if you just if you get into the habit of turning away from the cookie jar it'll get easier right just keep doing it right so if they as they begin to do, and so as they you, know, you can kind of keep encouraging them to do the, the same thing and that's basically reinforcing the association that they actually have so that when reason begins to kick in 
then you can start talking to them about the individual virtues. Like, well, temperance is what, is what we do when, you know, we get into the habit or we just repeatedly turn away from the candy. I mean, it doesn't mean from time to time we don't do it, but we just turn away from the candy so that it gets easier to do that. And you start engendering that in the children. And you also reward virtuous behavior, basically. Okay. Uh, what if we observe the suffering of a person on a long-term basis? For example, uh, audiovisual harassment of a timid and disadvantaged person by, uh, by a type of bully. Do we stand by and say nothing? Well, first thing is we have to be willing to suffer what that person is going through as well, just as Our Lady was will, uh, accepted the suffering of her son. So interiorly, there should be a certain level of attachment and willing to embrace that suffering if that's what, you know. However, on the external level, we may have to intervene in order to, uh, to do, I mean, sometimes we may have to do something. I mean, physically remove the person from the situation or to, uh, that is causing the problems or the damage. As far as saying something, there is the general principles of fraternal correction, which basically means one of the primary principles is in saying something, will the person who's doing something bad take the correction? If they won't, you don't say anything. Because, as St. Thomas says, if you say something and it makes the situation worse, you become culpable for making it worse. Whereas if they'll take the correction, then you have an obligation to say something. So you have to be willing to suffer it. You also have to be willing to suffer the fact that you're probably going to get chaffed at from uh, correcting people. But uh, it should be governed by a, a reasonable judgment of whether the person will take the correction. When I suffer or a family member suffers, I pray for God to help by removing the suffering. This, I guess, is wrong because I'm impeding the development of virtue for myself and for my relative or friend. Instead, should I be praying specifically for strength to deal with the suffering? Yes, what you should be praying for is asking Christ for the grace to accept the cross for as long as he chooses for you to accept it and to gain the virtue out of it and the purification out of it or the merit for other people out of it that he wants you to gain. Is saying the rosary enough for meditation? Well, rose, the rosary is meditative, but it's not meditation as such. In other words, you're still doing the vocal prayers, you're saying something vocally, so in that level it's a combination of meditation and um, vocal prayer. But meditation, um, you should be, you know, the average person should, I think, the average layman should be doing 15, at least 15 minutes of meditation a day, which means you put everything else aside and you just pick a, uh, an object of meditation like our Lord's mercy or his profession, his goodness, his, uh, his piety, which means how good he takes care of us, and focus on that and how it applies to your life, etc. So it should be, um, and that should just be that straight meditation. How do you know if there's something is a duty versus an area of pride that you like? Can you be too exact? Uh, okay, let's answer the first part of the question. How do you know if something is a duty um, rather than an area of pride? Well, you have to first look at your state in life. What's your state in life? Are you a married woman? Well, then, um, you know, you should, you should keep a, a good house. I mean, things should be, generally speaking, try to keep it clean. Try and keep it well appointed and, su and, and, su uh, and suitably um, decorated, etc. But um, the area of pride, how do you know there's, that there's pride in it? If in looking at the thing, it's self-referential. And by that I mean that, you know, when you do it well, you feel good about yourself and that you look at that thing and make you think that you're better than you actually are. Okay. Sometimes pride will, you know... People will say, well, you know, I have this talent. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you know, everybody thinks, well, i got to find out what my talent is. Well, I'm sorry, but there are certain people who just don't have a lot of them, or none in some cases. I mean, maybe, they're, maybe the, what God wants them to do is just to, to develop the virtue of humility. So, and I think that, it doesn't mean that God doesn't give us individual perfections, etc., but it just means that... Um, a lot of times people tend to take pride in what they think they're good at when in point in fact they're not that good at it. In other words, maybe one of the things to do, and this is one of the things I suggest, is start, if you're worried that it might be an area of pride, um, is start asking your guardian angel to humiliate you 
and ask him to show you that this, whether this is an area of pride or not. Ask Our Lady to reveal it through grace, to give you that grace to see it. Start saying the litany of humility with the express intention of asking God for the grace to see whether this is an area of pride or not. Because generally speaking, pride is very blinding and we can't really see it without grace as a general rule. Can you be too exact? Um, yes and no. No, in the sense of as far as your own interior life, submitting to your job and what you should at that moment do. So you can't be too exact in that regard. However, sometimes you get people who are uh, claiming that they're being exact according to their state in life, and all they're doing is driving everybody out of their tree. And by that I mean, for example, of, of you know, the... Uh, the duty of the state in life is there, there's a kind of a lack of priorities. Your primary duty is to the spiritual well-being of your, of your husband or wife and your children, then to their material upkeep. And so sometimes people will say, well, my duty is to pray for my children so that they never take care of the household. Or they'll basically, they, the wife thinks, well, I, you know, my job is to keep up the household and make sure the children learn how to do this stuff. And so they're standing there with a stick, beating the children to make sure that they're taking care of the, of the dishes, right? So in other words, it can go to excess in the way in which it's done, not as to the interior disposition of dying to always doing it when it's necessary. What does meditation look like for a mom of many children? It looks ugly. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Okay. Uh... It basically means that you have to try and find some manner in which either you get up early or you go to bed late, um, in which, or you just, if your kids are old enough, you say, I'm not available for the next 15 minutes, and you go in your room, close the door, and put the earplugs in and hope the house doesn't burn down. But you have to, you basically have to start segmenting out of time. This is one of the reasons why a regimen is helpful. I realize that in a family, a big family, a regimen is exceedingly difficult. But sometimes if people can get into some kind of a regimen, because the regimen helps us develop that virtue easily. Um, so basically, it just means if you have a lot of little children, it just means that you're going to have to probably get up a little earlier before the children do. Or when the children are all taking their naps or preoccupied, then you take a little bit of time and do the meditation. Sometimes you have to sneak the meditation in at various times, but it's really a development of getting into the habit of being able to do that when you have that opportunity. What about duties versus um, duties of state versus meditation? Um, basically, our ob if you look at our obligations, it's to God, then to um, our own self spiritually, then our children and our, our, hus our, our husband and children, or wife and children spiritually, and then materially it breaks down from there. But our duties, basically our primary duty is to God. So um, this means that if a person uses their duties of their state in life as an excuse not to pray at all during the course of the day, they are failing their primary duty. Now our normal obligations in relationship to God are fulfilled by fulfilling our duties in relationship to other people. So it may be if you have a lot of children that your duties of your state in life are going to take up, that is taking care of the family, taking care of the children is going to burn up a bulk of the day. So you're not going to get the luxury of spending an hour in prayer and meditation and spiritual reading. You're probably just not going to get that. But it doesn't mean you don't do any meditation or you don't do any kind of praying. You should just need, you need to make sure that you're getting that time, uh, trying to segment out the time or rearranging the schedule a little bit. And sometimes too, you know, Johnny doesn't have to go to that fifth, you know, that fifth kind of activity. Let's just cut it back to two so that Johnny still gets to get engage in those kinds of activities, but that it frees up more time in relationship to the family. My sister used to have this practice, which I thought was actually a good one. She would tell her children, you get one extracurricular activity which will, will require obligations on my side, and that's it. Because otherwise, you get this thing where, you know, every, all the, basically the woman's a chauffeur in the end. She's just taking kids from one thing to another. And she's not, and the kids aren't meditating, the people aren't meditating, etc. The thing is, too, is if you're teaching your kids to pray regularly, you're going to be getting your, you're going to be getting your prayer in. If you teach them to meditate, you can start meditate when they meditate, too. What about sleep? I highly recommend it. All right.
It depends largely on the individual. Virtue is a mean, uh, moral virtues are a mean relative to the individual, which means what? That they're somewhere in the middle between excess and defect, but where that middle line is depends on the particular individual. So, for example, a guy who's 6'4 and works a hard job on construction, for example, is going to eat a lot more food and still be temperate than, say, the guy who just, you know, he's 5'3 and has a desk job and he just clicks buttons, okay, because the bodily demands are going to be more. The same thing is actually true in relationship to sleep. I know people... I know a priest. He can he can go six hours without, or he can only go he can get four hours of sleep a night, and he's perfectly fine, right? Other people, if they don't get their seven or eight hours of sleep, they're a bit of a mess, right? So, as far as cutting back on the sleep, you just have to make sure: is the cutting back on the sleep detracting from my virtue? Is it making it much more difficult, or significantly more difficult, to teach the uh, to treat the children well, or my husband well, or my wife well, or what have you, if it's detracting from that. If it's not, if you can cut out about 15 minutes of sleep or get up 15 minutes early to do your meditation, then you should do so. But it's, your body will tell you, and how you react will tell you whether you're cutting too much back on the sleep. And the same thing applies to fasting. If you're fasting too much, your body will let you know. So, okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Binding prayers are basically, uh, if you have authority over the person, you can command the demon to be bound so that they don't perform, to engage in a certain kind of activity. If you don't have authority over them, you can ask Christ or Our Lady to bind them so that they can't do certain things. So, yes? Uh, follow up question about the foundation of pre-virtue for young children. Yeah. I was very about what you said, but I do wonder about your thoughts about some of the psychological arguments Thesis of being punished by rewards and the danger of the excessive use of rewards. Yes. Displacing the proper motivation, right? Because virtue isn't just about the frequency of behavior, but also about the interior motivation. There's more about that yes. transition from early childhood to young adulthood, and your thoughts about the moderation of the use of rewards. Of course, yeah. Displace the motivation you're trying to have. Yeah, that is actually very true. Um, my father one time said to me, he said, Ch- uh, children, especially boys, have to be raised a little lean. And by that he means this. He means it doesn't mean you don't reward them and you don't compliment them at certain times. But it shouldn't be every single time they get it. Because then what happens is is the reward becomes the compensation for actually performing the action rather than the actual doing of the action itself. The interior motivation comes from essentially two sources. One is that there's a moderated use of rewards and punishment to some degree, but also not giving the reward all the time. In other words, people um, people have to be recognized that sometimes I have to do a lot of stuff to get this thing that I need to achieve. They did a study, I don't know if you saw it, they did a study, I don't know how you do a formal study of all this, but they did a study of billionaires. And they asked them, what's your greatest fear? And they said, across the board, like 80% of them said, my greatest fear is, is that my children have no motivation. Okay, where does motivation come from? Motivation comes from something that's lacking in you that you need, and that you recognize that you need, and the knowledge that if I perform specific things, I can attain that thing that I need. That's where it comes from. If every time I need something, it's just handed to me, there, I'm never going to take the action necessary to achieve the thing. This is why you have to give some types of rewards and you have to give um, motivation. Now, how does that come? Well, one of the ways is, is that I often recommend to people is that when kids reach a certain age, you tell them, uh, look, your job is to go mow the lawn. And if you mow the lawn, I'll give you a buck. Right? So then the kid gets motivation to, learn, to earn the dollar. Right? And outside of that, you don't give him any money. So that he has to begin the process of realizing that I, as a man, have to attain this on my own, and I can't just expect an entitlement program from the government to give it to me, right? So there has to be a recognition that, but sometimes also, you just have to tell him, go do this. Am I getting paid for it? No, you're not. 
You're just gonna go do it because it's the right thing to do. So that they recognize that in, for example, in marriage, there's certain obligations you just have to fulfill that you're not gonna get rewarded for. You're not gonna get anything for it because that's just your duty. But that the actual doing of itself and becoming a good person in the process is the reward. And so that's why it really boils down to the moderation of the rewards. But it's also the same thing in moderations of, of, the, of punishments. It's right in scripture where it says, Husband, or, uh, fathers, don't nag your children, lest they lose heart. In other words, every time the kid does something wrong, you don't beat him you know, or, or harangue him or demean him or whatever the case is. What you do is you do it in a moderated way in, in times in which... You know, he, he might think to himself, well, can I get away with this? Well, every so often when he doesn't get away with it, he's going to realize, you know, this just isn't worth it. But if you're constantly after him, then what's going to happen is the kid's going to think, I can't do anything right. And so that's what has to be avoided. Okay. Someone over here had a question. Hand up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, so the authority is, yeah, so what, what are the limits of the authority? What, what are the boundaries and who you have authority over? It's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it depends upon primarily what's called an office. So, for example, a husband, as because of his office, has authority over his wife because of the fact that she, he is um, uh, her head. The wife doesn't have authority over her husband in the spiritual sense, but she does have authority over his body. Now, what does that mean? When you get married, I mentioned this, I think marriage is an exchange of bodily rights in which you give uh, rights of your body over to the other person. So she can do binding prayers for you based upon that right. Um, she can, the husband and the wife, uh, the wife as mother has the office over her children, so she can do binding prayers over her children. It is the common consensus, and it seems to bear out in my own experience, that you have, once your children are adopted, before then you don't, but before they're, once they're adopted, you have dominion over them or authority over them, and so as a result, you can bind them. The jury is out about grandparents. Because it's once removed and the, grand, the parents have the direct right and the grandparents don't necessarily, the general consensus is, is that they don't. Siblings, do they have authority over each other? Not unless it's delegated by the parents. However, it seems to be the one case where people can say binding prayers for their other siblings and they don't get retaliated against. So, and kids, and for the same reason, can kind of do it for the parents. We think that it basically comes from the obligations of the fourth commandment. We think that's why they're protected. So, but outside of that context, they don't necessarily have authority. Superiors in a religious order have it over their, their people, bishops over their priests, etc. Priests can say binding prayers for anybody because they have, they have uh, spiritual authority over all people so, uh, by virtue of their priesthood. Um, and so you just have to kind of look to make sure that you have that authority. The only exceptions, as I mentioned, are children and siblings. For some reason or other, we think it's kind of the fourth commandment, that they have the ability to say the binding prayers and still be spiritually protected. If, they, if you start saying binding prayers for people you don't have authority over, you're going to get taken to the woodshed. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, technically speaking, this uh, praying in some in praying in someone's name. Okay, yeah. The question is is what about praying for in someone's name? Does that give you the authority over it? Technically, no. To say praying in in someone's name just technically means you're praying for that person or for that person's intentions. That's technically theologically what it means. The idea of praying in someone's name is actually, I have yet to find any person who, to, who um, promotes that idea. Um, I have yet to find anybody who can give me an adequate theological uh, foundation for it in, in the church's traditional teaching. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't, it doesn't mean that you can't be praying for somebody or if someone says, would you pray for so-and-so or would you pray 
in my name for, uh, for X, for me, actually all they're doing is asking you to pray for them, technically. So uh, the, only different, the only time that, that, is, uh, that I can see that that would have some kind of force is when a bishop or a priest is delegated to do a specific set of prayers for a specific intention. But that's because of the nature of the priesthood, things can be delegated, and so the priest, for example, every time he does exorcism work, is actually praying in the name of the bishop. But it doesn't work for lay people. That's my understanding of it theologically. That doesn't mean that somebody says, would you pray in my name for X? Yeah, you can pray for the person in those particular things. Sorry, I didn't mean to burst any bubbles. Yeah. No. No, the godparents actually don't have the same uh, authority that we've experienced. By the way, this is based largely on experience. We, we've kind of heard it down to authority is based on office and it's based on civil. The reason we've discovered that is because we have had people who are godparents saying binding prayers, commanding binding prayers for their godchildren, and then they get retaliated against significantly. So we're not, you know, so it doesn't seem to give them any authority. The obligation to correct them in relationship to their Catholic faith doesn't seem to give them sufficient authority. That's just our experience. <coughs> yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's always, it, it, it can be. In the sense of the, uh, for example, when a bishop gives a th faculties to a priest to do exorcism work, it's uh, based on certain conditions. He can say, for example, uh, he can say, you have faculties to do exorcisms over this person, so you have the authority, until such time as the person is liberated or you cease working with them. So if you cease working with them and then 10 months later they come back, you have to get faculties again. I'm sorry, one more time. In other words, oh, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. I would probably put it a little bit differently. What you're saying is true, but it's a little bit differently. There's a distinction between having the authority or a power and the right to use that power. So for example, when you're ordained, pe most people do not understand this at all. When you're ordained a priest, you have the power of the priesthood. You do not have the right to make use of it at all. You have the power, you don't have the right to make use of it. The only time you have the right to make use of it is when the church concedes you the right to make use of it. So if I don't have the right, it's called faculties. If I don't have the right to hear confession, even though I have the power to absolve sins of my priesthood, I don't have, in this particular case, that lack of right actually negates it, and your, your, your uh, confession's invalid, right? So this is a very key point. In marriage, the husband has authority over the father, or the, sorry, the husband has authority over the mother and the wife. However, that authority, if he abuses the authority, only during the time in w that, that his right to make use of that authority becomes suspended. Now, there's a moral principle called abuse does not take away use. What that means is, if he abuses his wife um, in a certain sense, like, for example, if he's abusive and says, you know, uh, you know I, I don't want you going to Mass anymore, I don't want you doing this, or what have you, she doesn't have to submit in relationship to those things for which he's, he's being abusive or abusing. However, in relationship to the stuff that he's making legitimate use of, she still has to submit. So it's the same thing in relationship to authority. Just because an authority gets abusive in one area doesn't mean you can completely write them off. It's the same thing, for example, if a magisterial member says something contrary to the faith, it doesn't mean that you can completely dismiss that individual's authority. It just means that in that particular area, you just ignore him when he's teaching something contrary to the faith. But outside of that, you still have the obligations to follow it. Does that make sense? It's just a different way to say the same thing, but it's, it's based more on the, how the church used to make those distinctions. Okay, we'll stop there.